Hi guys and welcome to Grade 11. It's physical science and it's going to be a rocking show. As you can see, I've got Bruce next to me. Hi Bruce. I'm um, well and thanks. And you Indy? Good, good, good. I'm excited to be doing a show with you. Excellent. It's been a long time, eh? Yeah, and today yeah. we've got an exciting lesson. It's all about gold. It's about the bling bling and the gold. Yeah, Indy said we're going to have a rocking time. Well, we're going to be looking at gold mining exactly. and obviously extraction of gold. Um, from the rocks and uh, its applications in South Africa as a gold mining country. And uh, I'm going to be taking you through, the, through some of the important aspects of gold and gold mining and its extraction in the next hour. Awesome. Okay, Bruce, take right, your spot great. while I do my usual thing. Okay, guys, what you need to do is you need to chat to us on facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Also, chat to us on Twitter at learn extra. I'm <coughs> here to help you out with anything you may need. If there's anything Bruce is going over, pop it on the page and I'll get him to answer as we're going along. We want this to be an interactive lesson. And don't forget that this page is not just for us guys, it is also for you. So start chatting. Um, before we start, it's the usual. We are giving away a Casio calculator today to the person or the learner or the mindset that posts the best post, whether it be an inspirational tip, you might be helping other out another mindset, maybe it's a quote, um, even a question. Let's just get chatting, guys. Um, also, big shout out to Liberty, you guys rock. Thanks so much for making this show possible. And before we run out of time, let's go over to Bruce. Bruce, take it away. Great, Indy, thanks very much indeed. Guys, as we said in the introduction, what we're going to be doing is having a look at the gold mining industry in the country. Now, you might say, well, how scientific is that? Well, it's not really got too much to do with the physics and chemistry that you guys are probably used to. However, it certainly does apply to the science of geology and probably geography. Okay, so there might be a, you might, well, you might find, shall I rather say, quite a big tie-in between your uh, geography, those of you guys who do geography at school, and what I'm going to speak about today. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of important aspects uh, associated with the Earth and the Earth's crust, and then we're going to look at the gold mining industry per se. We are going to look at the extraction of gold. There is a little bit of chemistry associated with that, and uh, then we're going to have a look at a typical type of question that um, you might uh, come across in the exam. And probably to end the show today, I'm going to be looking at the environmental impacts of gold mining in South Africa. And a lot of you guys will probably have a few thoughts and a few ideas, and maybe you want to drop them onto the Facebook. Um, your ideas about the environmental impacts of, of gold mining in the country, and maybe just in mining in general, because it's, it can be such a controversial topic, not only in South Africa, but also internationally as well. So guys, what I've done, I've just developed an introductory slide here where we're going to have a look, a very basic look at the chemistry of the Earth's crust. Now, if you watched last week, I think Tracy took, uh, had took the lesson on this and she probably would have introduced some of this to you already. Um, if she has, that's great. It'll be revision. If she didn't, well, this is just a couple of little pointers to, uh, to get us through and to sort of set up the lesson on gold. And the important thing is, is that the Earth's crust is made up of approximately 80 different elements. Okay. And those 80 different elements can combine into over 2,000 compounds. Okay. Now, what are our most common elements that we've got? Well, the most common elements that we find are going to be oxygen, silicon, aluminium, iron, and calcium. Generally, they make quite a bit of the, um, quite a bit of the composition of the, uh, of the Earth's crust. Okay. Um, iron, you probably know, uh, you've probably heard a lot, lot of iron-based compounds. Aluminium, you're probably not too sure about, but... Um, uh, aluminium actually is one of the third most abundant elements that we actually have in the Earth's crust. Okay, so very important that we are able to uh, speak about aluminium. And in fact, when you get to grade 12 next year, when you do your electrochemistry section, there's a whole section on the extraction of aluminium and how we extract aluminium from its, uh, from its mineral, from its ore. And you learn about that next year as one of the electrochemical processes. Okay, however, let's have a look now at a few things that are important, a couple of important little terms that might be in, uh, that you guys need. Um, it says these metals are seldom found in their pure form, so it's very rare that we actually find pure aluminium. Very rare that we find, uh, we, we, very rare that we actually find um, pure copper. It's very rare that we actually find 
pure iron. We always find it mixed and bond, or shall I rather say, in a, in a sort of chemical compound, and that chemical compound is what we mine, and then we actually purify and extract it out of the, out of the ore itself, and uh, we are able then to get to isolate the compound. But we often find them in the substance, what we call a mineral, okay? And it's quite important to understand what we mean by a mineral. Now, there are quite a few definitions of minerals that, um, that you'll probably see in textbooks. And yeah, look, there's a lot of discussion that goes on as to what is actually, what is actually the correct definition of a mineral. I know in some of the textbooks out there, I, don't, I personally don't agree with the exact definition of a mineral. So what I've done, I've taken sort of um, uh, extracts or I've sort of amalgamated and joined together a whole lot of uh, facts from the textbooks and I've produced a little understanding of what I think of basically as a mineral. It's an, our natural minerals are naturally occurring compounds that are found in the earth's crust which describe the chemical composition and structure of that substance. Okay, and that's quite a nice, I think that sort of encompasses pretty much everything that we would probably need in a definition of what an actual mineral is. It's naturally occurring, okay, in the earth's surface and uh, it describes the chemical composition and the structure of that compound. That's, that's present. Now, I've got some examples here of some minerals, and you'll see that some of them are actually quite complicated in their chemical formula. Now, guys, you don't have to worry about having to learn this. Okay, um, I'm just putting this up here for a little bit of uh, in, uh, interest and information. Um, a mineral that's probably everyone's heard about is quartz. Okay, um, that's basically silicon dioxide. Now, that's a fairly simple sort of formula that we've got there. Now, gold itself is also classified as a mineral. And you might say, well, isn't gold a pure element? It's not actually found uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a chemical compound. Well, gold can be classified as a mineral because it is naturally occur occurring in the, earth's, on, in the Earth's surface, in the Earth's crust. Gold is actually a particularly unreactive substance. So therefore, they can mine gold okay, in its pure form. However, there is a type of compound called calvarite, okay, and calvarite, or sorry, calvarite, and calvarite is a mineral that involves gold and tellurium, okay. Now, tellurium is a very exotic element. Um, it's found as one of the very heavy metals in your periodic table. The chemical formula for tellurium is TE, and you probably find you might have not even come across it before. Okay, so it can get quite complicated. Hematite, um, I think a lot of people might have heard about hematite. Okay, it's an iron oxide, Fe2O3. Fairly simple formula. Um, everyone's heard of iron oxide, but we actually call that hematite, and the iron oxide is one of the, um, one of the components of rust. It's sort of that ready brown color, but we do find it in the Earth's crust, as hematite, and we do mine it as, as iron, and we will be doing a, a program on iron and the extraction of iron ore from the Earth's crust a little bit later on uh, in the next couple of weeks. So guys, you can certainly tune in and make sure that we, uh, that we understand that. And then we get a substance called orthoclase. Now, now we're getting to some quite exotic-looking substances. Well, if you have a look at that chemical formula for orthoclase, well, look at it. Potassium, aluminium, silicon, and oxide now, you're probably saying, wow, where on earth do they get a chemical compound like that? Very, very fancy uh, chemical compound. Guys, you certainly will not be asked to give the chemical structure for that. All I'm trying to show to you guys is that these minerals that we do find in the Earth's crust can be quite complex. Okay. And obviously, then, we need to extract. Okay. Um, yeah, fancy name, potassium aluminium silicate. And then we have copper, okay? Now, copper we find as a substance called malachite, okay? Malachite over here, which involves a copper carbonate hydroxide compound, okay? Also quite exotic, although we can find copper in its pure form, and we are able to extract it in its pure form along that way. So, guys, there now is just a very brief overview of some of the, of the minerals, um, De defining a mineral, what is a mineral, and just some of the more exotic ones that we do get. But what we need to do, obviously, now, is we're going to focus in on gold. Okay, We're going to look at gold because it's one of the major minerals that we do mine in South Africa. 
it's, is very important in terms of uh, our econo economy, okay, because of the amount of money that gold can generate for the, for, the, uh, for the country in terms of being able to sell the gold to the rest of the world. And if you watch TV, I think you can see the gold price is around about $1,600, $1,700 an ounce, which is rather a large amount of money. So therefore, highly profitable to actually be able to extract this gold out of the earth and be able to sell it on. And South Africa is one of the major gold-producing countries of the world. So it's really a lot of the gold is, is concentrated at the southern tip of Africa, good for us, and we can sell it on to the rest of the world. Okay, right. Now, let's have a look now at the mining and processing, processing of gold. Right, bit of history. When was gold discovered, guys? Well, gold was basically discovered in on the Vidvatistrand, a farm called Vidvatistrand, and it was in 1887 that there was this sudden rush. They, they found gold on the Vidvatistrand, and all of a sudden, all these people came, and there was a gold rush in South Africa. If you, if you know a little bit of history and you watch maybe some other television, there are other places around the world that have had gold rushes. I know there were lots of gold rushes in California in around about the 1840s, in Alaska, Okay, in Australia, but in 1887, the eyes of the world turned on South Africa, they found gold, and people came flocking from all over the world to South Africa, landed by ship in Cape Town or Durban, and then made their way up to the Witwatersrand, and from there sprang the village, which then create, uh, was expanded out, and in a very short time became this huge city, which we now know as Johannesburg. And we also know that the native South Africans named Johannesburg Egoli. Egoli simply meaning the city of gold. And that's where Joburg got its nickname as such. Right, now, how was gold actually extracted? Now guys, this is reasonably important because they can ask you questions on this in your exams. And there are three main techniques. I'll put you a number of techniques we use, but I'm going to concentrate only on three main techniques. The first one is the simplest technique. And this was probably used by the um, early miners when they got to the Witwatersrand. They were finding gold on the surface and therefore they were able to basically pan for gold. Now, a lot of the gold is found in streams because generally it's washed through by water. So what the, um, the, the, the first miners would have done is basically, well, let's call them surface miners because they were on the surface of the ground. They were basically going to the streams and panning for gold. Okay, and how does panning for gold take place? Well, it's very simple. I've got a little picture there for you guys. Well, we have a pan, which is called, yeah, it's just basically a, uh, a sifting pan. And what they do is they put sand and they put gravel and they mix it with water and then they shake it. Okay, and the important thing is, is that gold is a very heavy, very dense material. Therefore, pure gold would actually fall to the bottom of the pan. The sand and the gravel would basically sift out of the pan or move out of the pan, leaving the small little flakes, chips, nuggets, whatever, if they were really lucky, got a nice nugget, nuggets of gold behind. And the prospector, as that's what they called them, the guys who were panning for gold, the prospector would then be able to take the gold and he would then go and sell it. And they would have a, uh, a sort of me a measuring scale and they were able to, um, to sell their gold and that's how they made their money. Now, um, the other areas in South Africa, around about the same time, um, Pilgrim's Rest was a very, very um, popular area. They found gold in Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Rest. And another place uh, in the uh, Mpumalanga region was a little village called Barberton. And you might remember that name, Barberton, uh, along the way. That's where they also found gold. So, um, yes, they had found deposits of gold around South Africa, but on the Witwatersrand, that's where the big strike was in 1887. Right, now, as we start getting um, more and more gold being found, and they were now obviously starting to uh, um, uh, discover the gold on the surface, where did the gold, where was the gold? Well, obviously on the surface was fine, they could pan for it. But if it was fairly close to the surface and they had to go down a bit, another technique that they're able to use to extract gold is what is called open cast mining. And there's the diagram there. And open cast mining is simply 
digging down layer by layer as they go through the gold-bearing rock. Okay, Layer by layer, they were able now to extract or pull the gold out of that gold-bearing rock and they were able to cart it off. Okay, Obviously, more difficult type of work because it's not as simple as panning for gold. But if, if there is gold, they've got to dig down underneath, underneath the, top, uh, the top surface of the soil and therefore open cast mining was another example there. Now, we don't have much open cast mining in South Africa when it comes to gold. The reason being is that the gold bearing rock that we have got in this country is actually pretty deep. Okay? It sort of goes down at an angle, sort of, a sort of uh, a diagonal trajectory. So if we had to go open cast mining, we would have to have a huge area which would have to be dug layer by layer. And that was just too labor intensive. So the third method of gold mining is what they call shaft mining. And that is probably 90% of the gold mining uh, companies in South Africa use the technique of shaft mining. And that picture I'm sure you've seen quite a lot of, especially the, um, the learners who live in and around Johannesburg and maybe in the, in the gold belt towards um, uh, uh, Verenigung and down that way towards Falcom and the Free State. There we have our shaft mining. Well guys, what we've got there is a very uh, typical type of, um, of setup, and that now represents simply the lifts that go down the shafts and are able to drop the miners down very deep into the earth's surface, and then what they do is they tunnel into the rock with their, with their drills and things like that, and the miners are able to drill, blast, extract the ore, and then send it upwards. Okay, and there we now have the shaft mining technique. Okay, pretty dangerous type of technique, guys. Okay, um, unfortunately, lots of accidents do happen. We still have accidents in this country. As soon as you go deep under the Earth's surface, all possibilities of rock falls that come in, uh, cavens, okay, um, explosions through uh, pockets of methane gas and stuff that are, f that are trapped between the rocks, highly flammable gas, methane gas, gas. And unfortunately, it does lead to a certain number of fatalities. Um, in the gold mining community. So it is quite a dangerous technique. Okay, and what I've done here is just to try and show you a little bit of a summary of all those techniques. So what we've got here, if, if these sort of uh, dots, okay, and these layers represent the gold-bearing rock, in other words, where the gold deposits are, can you see now that where position number one represents a quite a close gold seam near the surface? Okay, so near the surface, these portions of the gold-bearing rock, that could be easily uh, obtained through um, open-cast mining. No problems there. However, do you see now number three? Okay, can you see that this gold-bearing rock is now sloping downwards? So therefore, open-cast mining is not going to work for that one. So what we're going to have to do is that we're going to have to sink a shaft. Okay, so here's your shaft. Whoops, let's get a pin up. And... Put it there. So we're going to put the shaft there. There's, we're going to sink our shaft. Okay. And as we sink the shaft down, then we can drill tunnels. Okay. And there are the tunnels going into there. We drill the, drill the tunnels uh, following the rock. And as you can see now, there is the gold-bearing rock in these tunnels over here. And therefore, the miners are able to trace and follow that gold-bearing rock. And if it had to go deeper, okay, if it had to go deeper, and what we do is very simply, they would drill more shafts into the earth like that, and they would then follow the gold all the way down. Guys, we start talking about some pretty serious depths here. We go down to nearly three kilometers, four kilometers underground. And if I'm not mistaken, I think South Africa holds the record for the deepest shaft mine in the world, where we've gone down almost four and a half to five kilometers. Very, very difficult conditions that deep underground. Very, very hot, okay? Um, very dangerous conditions, huge pressures, okay, of the earth pushing down on top of those tunnels. Okay, so it is a dangerous game, and, uh, but in pursuit of gold, that's the chances that, that uh, the, gold, uh, the gold mine operators are prepared to take. Okay, I think, Andy, that's sort of as a little intro into the process of gold mining. 
That's great. I think what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break. There are a whole bunch of questions coming on the page, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we want this lesson to be about. It's all about questions and answers, and those are your <coughs> questions and answers. So while we take a break, get those fingers typing, post onto our page, facebook.com forward slash learn extra. And you can even chat to me on Twitter at learn extra. Let's get chatting. See you now after the break. Hi guys and welcome back to Learn Extra Live. We are having such an awesome time and there are so many questions coming on the page. We are getting to them um, probably in the last 15, 20 minutes of Ooh, the show. We want to maybe we can take a couple now. now. Yeah, okay, we can take okay. a couple now and then Bruce, we can move on. Bruce says now and then we can move on. So <laughs> let's so let's let's have a look. So now I'm going to say um, my poor ne, she asks open cast um, and shaft mining diagram. Is mm. it important to know um, for exam purpose? Um, Put it this way, I don't think they're going to ask you to draw it, okay? But what they might do is they might give you two different pictures, okay? Like I've given you now, or sketch diagrams, and ask you to label which one's open cast mining, which one would represent shaft mining. But I don't think they're going to ask you any, um, any specifics. Uh, they're not going to ask you to draw it. I think they'll probably ask you to maybe to identify from pictures. That'll be my call. Cool, cool. Okay. okay, so now this one is from Takalani. Takalani's always on the page, always answering questions and asking <coughs> questions, which is awesome. And Takalani wants to know, what do we call the sediments where gold is extracted? Sorry? The sediments. Well, basically gold, gold is extracted through a type of quartz. Okay, so when we spoke about our mineral earlier, and that's our silicon dioxide, there's actually a type of quartz, and a, a special type of quartz-bearing rock. Okay, so let me say that again. Gold-bearing rock, which is made up of quartz. Okay, so what the geologists do is that they track this particular type of rock. Okay, and they're able to follow it. And they, call the, they, they, they follow this path, and this path is called a seam. And as they follow the seam, um, and they're able to track it, then they're able to work out where it's going. And, they, and that's why these, often these mines have to go so deep, because sometimes the seams sort of shoot downwards, and therefore they've got to go deeper and deeper and deeper to go and extract, to go and extract the, uh, the, the gold from that seam. Cool. Okay. okay, now this is a, a, a pretty cool question, and what the rad thing is is that Takalani's actually answered this question, so thank you for helping me answer it. That's what we need to see on the page. So now this is from Abu, and Abu wants to know, why is gold so, um, so expensive and more expensive than, say, iron? Okay, it's got to do with rarity at the end of the day. Iron is pretty, pretty common. Okay, it's one of the most abundant metals. Very useful metal, and that's what um, the Iron Age, if you go back couple of thousand years, the Iron Age man was able to use iron to create weapons, to create um, uh, uh, cast iron pots and things like that. There were lots of uses for it. Gold is rare, okay? Plus, gold has also got a very beautiful look to it. And therefore, the uh, gold, I mean, gold has been used as a, as a, as currency, as jewelry, as, as sort of a, a mark of wealth for thousands and thousands of years. So therefore, if we go way, way, way back, we know that if you go back, let's say, to the ancient Egyptians and things like that, gold was used very much as a symbol of wealth, as a symbol of currency. And therefore, um, basically, it got that iconic status because of its shininess. It's, it was very, it's a beautiful looking metal and also very easy to work with as well. So they were able to, to mold the gold uh, into all sorts of shape, and that's why it was used extensively for jewelry. And that's where its wealth and its, well, its, uh, its value sort of came from. And what about the difference between platinum and gold? Okay, platinum is a completely different element. Okay, if you look on the periodic table, you'll see that platinum has got the symbol PT, where gold has got the symbol, and I'll maybe as well put it up here, AU, where platinum is P PT. Now, platinum is even more rare than gold, okay, and therefore it has got a much bigger monetary value. Again, look on the news on television, they always quote the platinum price as well, and generally the platinum price is a fair amount of uh, US dollars higher than the gold price because it's so much rarer. And another thing, while Indies just told me about platinum and the questions come in, platinum is, is actually 50% of the world's platinum is actually found in South Africa. And that's why our platinum mines are very, very wealthy, um, very, very wealthy entities. They make a large amount of money, 
And uh, because of the, of the um, ability to sell platinum onwards to, um, to the rest of the world. And platinum is used in jewelry as well, okay? But it's probably pretty unaffordable in comparison to gold. If you had to go and buy a platinum jewelry, way more expensive than it is with gold. Okay. okay, we've got more questions, and they're pretty good. Okay, so now Anela says, um, this one, I hope, I hope this is true. Probably not, but we'll see. Is it possible for gold to be found in the mantle and erupt in a volcano? Well, out of a volcano? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, basically, that's what they call alluvial gold. Yes, it actually is. Oh, I want a volcano like that near my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you don't want a vol volcano going off next to your house. That's a big thing. But where does gold come from? It comes from the, in the, the, in the inner side, inside of the earth. And basically what happens is that, yes, it will be spewed up. Gold-bearing rock will be spewed up. And when that rock cools down and forms, um, and forms so these rocky outcrops, the gold is actually trapped inside. Now, that would have been done millions and millions and millions of years ago when the earth was being formed. So what would happen now is that with water, you get erosion. And with the water erosion, eventually the rock it will get worn down and the gold would then be extracted out of the rock. It would wash down in the rivers. And that's how they found the alluvial gold, the gold that's on the surface. And that's what the, uh, originally the miners, or should we call it the prospectors, would go out there and pan for would be this alluvial gold found in the rivers because it will be washed down in the streams. Okay, so yes, it would come up from the in, in, uh, inner parts of the earth. Okay, from the from the under, underneath the crust, and it would spew out, and it would be trapped in the rocks that will form as a result. Okay, cool. What we're going to do, mindset, is we're going to answer one more question, and then keep those questions coming for Bruce. We're going to let Bruce move on with his lesson. Okay. But let's do it. So now this one's from Kelly, and Kelly asks: um, between the lith lithosphere and the hydrosphere, where do we find the majority of gold? Yeah, you know, the, basically the gold is found just basically in the Earth's crust. Probably the first five to ten kilometers in the Earth's crust. That's where the majority of gold is going to be found. Can we go down to those sort of depths of ten kilometers? At this stage, probably not. Okay, I think that the, the pressures, the temperature, the heat that will be at the bottom of those mines would just be too much. Okay, so we are probably entering a phase where we could be pretty much at the, um, at the limit of, of man being able to work under the conditions of those very, very deep mining shafts at around about four and a half to five kilometers. So the majority of the, of the gold that we are able to get will be found between sort of um, between five and ten kilometers, or let's say from the Earth's surface down to about ten kilometers underneath the Earth's surface it's, uh, itself. Um, Will they, is, are there going to be, is there going to be lots of gold that's going to be sort of on the surface? Well, yeah, if we're able to go deep into certain mountains that contain the spe a specific type of, of uh, gold-bearing rock, yes, you probably could find gold that's still going to be on the surface. And they still, even today, they still find and develop new gold mines. And as they um, come across and the geologists are able to say, wow, I've just seen quite a lot of gold-bearing rock in this formation, this, they will go and try and uh, excavate and they will try and get the gold out because gold is such a precious material. And the world bases its economy on gold. Everything revolves around gold. Perfect. Cool. Okay, what we're going to do, guys, we're going to carry on with the lesson, but that doesn't mean that you need to stop sending your questions. Facebook.com forward slash learn extra or chat to me on Twitter at learn extra. Bruce, let's right. carry on. Okay, guys, so what we're going to have a look at, we've spoken a lot about the gold mining. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we process what we call the gold ore. Now, um, I've, what I've introduced here is the term ore, and we speak about ore quite a bit, and you can speak about gold ore, you can speak about iron ore, you can speak about copper ore, but what do we mean by ore? And this is quite important, so I would take note of this. It's this is the volume of rock that contains minerals which make it valuable for mining. So when we talk about a certain amount of ore, we're talking about a certain volume of rock. Okay, Inside are going to be the trapped minerals. Okay. Is it going to be gold? Is it going to be um, iron? Is it going to be copper? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we're going to talk about now gold ore. Okay, we mine it as gold ore, and then we're going to process it to extract the pure gold. Now, the important thing is, is that <coughs> excuse me, only a very small amount of gold is actually extracted for every ton of gold ore or ore that is mined. Okay, so it's quite a labor-intensive process. Okay. It uh, requires vast amount of rock, okay, which they're then able to crush, 
and they're able to get into a power form. Then they're able, they've got to chemically extract the gold from the, from the rock itself. But the amount of gold they actually get out is going to be very, very limited to the volume. And that is why when you look at, at gold mines and where they actually process all this rock, it's pretty large, pretty uh, hectic-sized equipment that they do have there. And all that rock that goes in that's basically brought up from deep down uh, from the mine shaft is taken up. You probably find they're only going to get a very small amount of gold out of it. So you can see now that the processing and extraction techniques have to be pretty good. Otherwise, how much is actually going to waste? And the questions that often get to spoken about now is that if you look at modern mining practices compared to maybe mining practices 120 years ago, 120 years ago wasn't that great. So in the mine dumps where they throw the, 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 uh, the, the leftover um, gravel and sand that's after they've extracted the gold, how much of those old mine dumps, how much gold is actually left inside those old mine dumps? And they're actually even starting to remine those, those, those mine dumps to try and extract any gold that might have been missed from uh, not such good techniques. But the important thing is, is that we're now going to have a look at that extraction process and the processing. And we call it gold cyanidation. Okay. Gold si in fact, let me pronounce it properly, gold cyanidination. Okay, it involves using a cyanide compound. Okay, and the cyanide compound is what we are going, what we have to use to extract the gold. Now, straight away, a lot of you guys should probably be jumping up and saying, "Well, cyanide is that not very toxic?" Absolutely, it is a lethal substance. Potassium cyanide, which they do use in this extraction process, is very, very toxic to the human body. So, therefore, great amount of care has to be taken when it comes to this, this extraction process. And basically, we're going to have a look at this chemical process, and we're going to see now exactly how it does work. Well, as I said, guys, the always crushed, the rock that comes up has to be crushed, and they then use sodium cyanide. They can use potassium cyanide, um, but they do like to use sodium cyanide, and there's the chemical formula for sodium cyanide, NaCN. And what happens is that when we add the sodium cyanide solution, is that the gold particles are actually dissolved out of the ore. Okay. And if you have a look at the chemical equation, it's a rather nasty looking equation, but we'll break it down and just make sure that we understand it. So what we've got is the gold ore, okay, well the gold sorry, the gold in the ore itself. Okay. Now how do we pull it out? Well, we're going to use this chemical process. We can't go there and take out uh, little bit by little bit, flake by flake. So they take the gold, they add the potassium, uh, sorry, the sodium cyanide in the presence of oxygen and water. And what it does, it forms this rather exotic looking uh, compound. It's called sodium gold cyanide or cyanate. Okay, sodium gold cyanate. And can you see now that the gold has now been extracted from the ore itself and placed into this, comp into this complex, this compound. Now, what we can then do is take this compound, this gold sodium cyanate, and we are able now to take that, and from there we're going to now pull the gold out of it. That's, that's the process. So the step one, okay, very important in this extraction, is to now chemically pull the gold out of the ore. Okay, and make and form this complex. And the important thing is, is that gold is actually oxidized. So if you now look at your, um, at your redox chemistry, and at this stage, I think a lot of you guys would have done some basic redox and understood the, compl the, the concept of oxidation numbers. What we can do now is have a look and see what is happening now in terms of the movement of oxidation oxidation numbers because we actually have a redox process on our hands. So let's have a look now, and I'm going to change the color of the pen. So if we look at gold in its pure form, we can see now that the oxidation number of gold, or any element in its pure form, is zero. Okay, And if we come across here, let's have a look now. Well, if we look at sodium cyanide, sodium is always plus one. Okay, Therefore, the cyanide portion is going to be uh, minus one. So therefore, we come over here, sodium is going to be plus one. Uh, cyanide is minus one. There are two of them. It's minus two. There's one sodium. It's plus one. 
We must remember that the total oxidation number must add up to zero. And therefore, can we see now that we have got, um, must be plus one. Yeah, there it is. So therefore, can you see, guys, that gold is actually in the plus one oxidation state. It has been oxidized. In other words, it has lost an electron. To form that compound that we're able to extract, we have to oxidize it, and we have now got it in the plus one oxidation state. So what do we now do after that? Well, the gold-bearing solution, so this here is going to be the gold-bearing solution. It's now separated. We separate it by filtration. Okay, so obviously the unreacted ore would stay behind. We filter it, so the filtrate that comes out now has now got the... Uh, the uh, dissolved, um, dissolved compound. And then what they do is that they add zinc to the, uh, to, the, to the filtrate, to the sodium gold cyanide complex. They add zinc powder. Okay. And what actually happens here is that the zinc reacts with this complex, and what it does, it displaces the gold out of the complex. So what happens now where gold now is there is plus one, can you see now it goes back to its original oxidation number of zero. So in other words, we have now got a reduction. Okay, we have actually reduced the, um, the gold and we've now got it back into its pure form. So there, guys, is the extraction technique. Okay, uh, the cyanide process, as they call it, they call it, and we are able now to pull the gold out the rock put into this cyanide complex, filter it, then take the cyanide complex, add zinc, and the gold comes out. And now they're able to extract pure gold out of that, out of that ore. And uh, yeah, basically, it's an example of a redox reaction. Okay. And that, in a nutshell, is the chemical process of extracting gold from its ore. Now, what a lot of you might be worried about is, well, the question might come through, do I have to learn that equation? I would be very, very surprised if they make you learn that equation. Okay. I think if they're going to test you, they will probably test you by giving you the equation and asking you what is happening here. Okay. And the important bits of chemistry that you have to know, this, and in this section is probably the only real bit of chemistry that is, uh, that's important at this stage, is that we have got the oxidation of the gold in the ore to the formation of that sodium gold cyanide complex. Okay. And then they might ask you, well, then what happens? Well, then it's filtered. The filtrate is then taken. The filtrate over here, the sodium gold cyanide complex, reacted with zinc, and gold is then displaced by the zinc. And we have now got our pure gold, which we're now able to purify. And I think that basically is very simply the process of extraction. Now, what we, I'm, I'm going to make a little start about as well is that we, we've had a few questions about the value of gold and some of the uses of gold and stuff like that. What makes gold so important to us? Well, the first thing is, is that it's a beautiful metal. It's a beautiful, shiny metal. And the value of the gold is based on that shininess. Also, it's rarity as well. So it's had a beautiful appearance, and it's been used for jewelry, as also as a measure of wealth, for absolutely thousands of years. The other thing about it, it's durable. Now, what does that word durable mean? Durable simply means that it doesn't tarnish. It doesn't lose its color, okay? It doesn't lose its shininess or anything like that. So in other words, a piece of gold that's been around for a thousand years would look, have looked exactly the same, whether we saw it a thousand years ago or whether we saw it today. That gold remains a nice, beautiful, shiny piece of that yellowy orange metal. Okay, so it's a very durable substance, and it also, it does not corrode. Okay, corrode means rusting. Now, if you think of our substances that do rust, iron, aluminium to an extent, but iron always rusts. You put iron in the presence of oxygen and water, it's going to rust, pretty much gets destroyed. And therefore, you can see now iron just does not have that ability to last. So again, this durability of gold 
allows it to, or gives it value because it's now going to remain a beautiful piece of metal pretty much for your entire lifetime. And you will not have to go and polish it up or have to go and replace it because it's been eaten away by anything. And I think we're going to take a break. I'll, I'll finish the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the characteristics after the break and then also take a few more questions. I think that sounds like a brilliant idea, guys. So I think that we're actually ending, I mean, in 15 minutes, the show is nearly over. You know what that means? That means that you've got about 15 minutes to get those questions in and we'll be going <coughs> as soon as we get back. Guys, um, see you now after the break. Hi guys and welcome back. We are going into the last nine minutes of the show. That means get those questions coming thick and fast because we're going to be going over them now. Um, Bruce, should we continue? Are you ready for a few questions? What should we do? Let's take a couple of questions like we did last time and then I'll finish up with the characteristics of gold. Okay, fantastic. Okay, now this one, I think Difalone, this is just a, did you know that 80% of the world's gold is still, I think he said, meant to say underground. Uh-huh. That's incredible. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, let's see. Can gold be dissolved if yes with which chemical? And that's from Kelly. We've just, yeah, Kelly, we've just done that. It's using that cyanide process, okay, where we add sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide to the gold, um, to the gold ore. Okay, what it does then, it takes the gold and puts it into this complex, which is in solution. So the gold is actually dissolved into the solution and then the, uh, the solution, the whole thing is filtered. The ore that do, that's now had all the gold taken out left behind, the filtrate that comes out, okay, contains this compound in solution. And then what they do, they add the zinc there and that extracts the gold and the gold then precipitates out of that solution and there they've now got the pure gold. Okay. okay. Now, I've got another question. It is said that coal is formed from organic um, matter when plants and animals decompose and accumulate it under sedimentary rock. Um, but he, somebody is wondering, um, but they wonder, where does gold originate from? Okay, gold, gold does not originate from any decomposition or any breakdown of matter. Gold is actually an element that is formed in the earth, and it was probably formed billions of years ago when the Big Bang took place. And you actually had the, um, the particles of, of matter that started to fuse. Protons and neutrons started to fuse together at the moment of the Big Bang. And therefore, the actual element of gold was produced, was made. And then when the Earth was formed, obviously from all the dust and the, and the particles that, were th that uh, was thrown out by the Big Bang itself, then the gold particles were actually trapped in the Earth's surface and... And that's what we're mining at the moment. So the gold that we are mining is probably billions and billions and billions of years old and probably goes back to the start of the start of time, to be quite honest. Okay, cool. Okay. And now this one is from Mosa, Mosa. And Mosa wants to know, what does the purification of gold residue to pure gold entail? So the gold residue to pure... Uh, th that's going to go through a whole lot of, of different refining techniques. I don't have those techniques with me at the moment. Okay, but they, they will be, obviously, once they've extracted the gold from the, um, from the cyanide complex, there will be other uh, measures that they will have to take place. But they actually, uh, they're not part of the, uh, the syllabus, and therefore, I haven't actually got those with me at the moment. Okay, cool. So let's ask, a w let's do, let's answer, so like an ask and an answer. Um, one more question, and this one is from Wilson, and Wilson says, is the pH of the solution after greater than, less than, or equal to seven. Okay, mm. I'm going to go back to a slide to answer that. And I'm going to bring it up over here. Right, I'm just gonna clean this up so we can just see it a little bit better. Okay, and if you look at that equation, have a look. Okay, have a look at this process. And you'll notice now that when you have this, um, this gold extraction using sodium cyanide, notice what the other product that's being formed. Okay? You've got sodium hydroxide. Now, sodium hydroxide is a base. It's an alkali. Okay? So the pH of the solution, after we have um, added the sodium cyanide, actually will be greater than 7. It will be a basic solution. Okay? Because of the, pr the, the production of, uh, of sodium cyanide there. Oh, sorry, not sodium cyanide, production of sodium hydroxide. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Cool. Right, should we go back to our... Let us continue. Our slide. There we go. Right, so guys, what have we got? First one, shiny. Second one, 
durable. Now, what are the next two? Well, malleable and ductile. Right. What do we mean by malleable and ductile? Malleable, the ability to change an object's shape. Ductile, the ability to pull it out into long wire form. And that's exactly what gold is also able to do. It's a fairly soft metal. So therefore, it's very easy to work with. So therefore, we can shape gold beautifully, okay? And once you shape gold beautifully, I mean, you can look at those beautiful ornaments and designs that you can get statues made of gold and stuff like that. And then we've got this thing here called ductility or being ductile. And that's the ability to pull it out into, into wire. Now, based on that, the ductility and the, and the ability to actually pull it out into, into wire, gold is actually a brilliant conductor of electricity. In fact, it's far better than copper. And we, but we use copper in our electrical cabling. Why don't we use gold? Well, I think at the end of the day, unless you're some sort of multi-jillionaire, it's going to cost you a huge amount of money to actually wire up your house using gold. However, in very special circumstances, uh, in, uh, using, for example, in, uh, in developing of space rockets and developing some very intricate circuitry, if you look at uh, what's happened on Mars now with the, um, the Mars lander that's just happened there, um, the exploring, the exploring probe, what's the name of that, uh, that lander again? Just can't just, just jumped out of Which my mind. Lander? Just the lander that's just landed on Mars at the moment. It's just explorer. Ex yeah, I, just, <laughs> I, just, I just can't remember the names jumped out of my, out of my mind. Me but too now. <laughs> but um, there, they would have to have some very intricate circuitry. They would have used gold there, guys. They wouldn't have used copper because they want to have the best conductivity they can possibly have. And gold is a very, very good conductor. So there's a pretty good chance that that particular explorer is now actually... Um, is actually pretty much wired up with gold. It's called the Mars Ro Rover. It's yeah, it's, it's it's not the Mars Rover. It's got a name. I just it's just gone out of my head at the moment. I'm sure someone on email Google, or the, Google, or That's maybe someone on the on the Facebook page I'm can come up it with guys. this. I will be okay, on the so if you can page help now. me, <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Now, this last one. A heat reflector. Gold has got the ability, and I'm sure a lot of people didn't actually know this. But gold has got a very good ability to reflect heat. Now, where would it be actually more practical to, to act as a heat reflector? Well, think about the satellites that orbit around the Earth. Think about the spacecraft that have, have, have gone into space. Men have gone into, uh, walked on the moon. Out there in space, they're going to need a lot of the sun's energy to be reflected away from certain very sensitive equipment. There's no atmosphere there to protect us from the earth, from the, from the sun, when you're out in space. So therefore, you will see that a lot of the paneling of a, um, of a satellite, and if you look at, these, at the space, at the space uh, modules that they sent to the moon, there was quite a lot of gold associated with it to reflect heat away. Otherwise, what would happen is that everything would overheat, your circuitry would fry up, and if you had people, like you had people going to the moon, what would happen? You'd have people actually being almost burned to a crisp as a, as a, as a result of that. So therefore, guys, probably a more obscure type of uh, characteristic of gold is this ability to reflect heat. Okay, so guys, there are our, our characteristics of gold. Shiny, durable, malleable and ductile, very good conductor of electricity, and also an excellent heat reflector. Now quickly, just in a few moments that we've got left, I thought I'd just quickly put this up and look at some of the enviro environmental aspects of gold mining. Now, um, I don't think you're going to have much of a chance to actually uh, go through it, but um, some of the problems that we have it, resource consumption, to, to mine gold, we need large amounts of electricity and water. Okay, so it's not something that we can do environmentally, not very environmentally friendly. Um, water can be poisoned, okay. Um, what you can have is you can have uh, cyanide maybe get into the water systems. We can have leaching of, uh, of, of the ores and it can start creating problems. We've got the solid waste, the ore, the, after you've extracted the, uh, the gold. What do we do with that? That's where the mine dumps come. Not particularly pretty, okay. Um, sort of a bit of an eyesore when you have to just dump all the soil. Uh, air pollution, okay, um, lots, especially in your open cast mining, you get a lot of sulfur dioxide that's being given off, and also um, 
we've got is our th- a threat to natural areas. Sometimes we have to go into very pristine areas and they have to mine the gold in some very beautiful areas. And there's always controversy because now you're going to be destroying the environment. So guys, there's just a couple of very quick um, environmental aspects concerning with, gold, concerning with gold mining and some of them not too good. Okay. Okay, guys, that is the end of our show. Grade 11s, thank you so much. It was awesome. Liberty, big up to you. <coughs> Thanks so much once again. In case you are going to be tuning out, don't. Next in the Grade 12 show, we do have Shanae coming up, and she is a young scientist who will be competing in the USU. Don't want to miss out. Thanks, Grade 11s. See you next week. Grade 12s, you're next. Bye. <laughs>